Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Today's episode has been sponsored by Serial Box. Serial Box delivers addictive book content in short listen or read installments designed to fit into today's fast-paced mobile lifestyle. Switch between listening and reading with a single click, picking up right where you left off. Learn more at SerialBox.com, S-E-R-I-A-L-B-O-X.com. I'm really excited to be here today with Stephen Rowley. Stephen is the best-selling author of Lily and the Octopus. His second novel, The Editor, comes out April 2nd. He has worked as a freelance writer, screenwriter, and newspaper columnist. A graduate of Emerson College, he currently lives in Los Angeles. So welcome to Stephen. Hi. Thanks for being here. I'm so thrilled. Thank you. So the editor was fantastic. I couldn't put it down. Oh. Really, I'm not just saying that. That was really great. So the editor revolves a lot around the fictitious relationship with Jackie Kennedy Onassis, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Onassis in the book, and your narrator, James Smale. So I was wondering how you picked her as the the focal point sort of of this interaction and how you came up with the idea for the whole book. Yeah, it's a little bit of an unexpected follow-up, I think, for those who read my first book, Lily and the Octopus, which was about a man sort of reckoning with the sort of impending death of his dog and grieving that relationship. But in order to understand the editor, I think we have to sort of backtrack and talk about Lily for, for one moment. Please, let's talk uh-huh. as long as you want. Let's talk and, about Lily. And, you know, that was a book that I wrote never expecting to publish it, let alone it becoming a bestseller or translated in 19 languages. And now there's a movie in development. That was just a, a small project, I thought, when I was writing it. And as a writer, I was just putting words on paper to try to understand. There was a, a real dog named Lily, a dog that I had, and I lost her to a brain tumor in 2013. I'm sorry. And I thought I was intellectually prepared for this loss. You know, writing is a very solitary occupation as it is, and I didn't realize how much I'd come to depend on the companionship of this this friend. But I thought, you know, I knew dogs don't live as long as people do. I thought I was prepared for this, but I was left sort of spiraling from the loss of her sort of daily companionship. And I sat down to to write just to try to understand. An octopus entered the picture because to me, it became very clear what I was writing about was attachment and how difficult it can be to let go. So there was something about having a sort of tentacular metaphor that made sense to me. But, you know, I, as, I, as I continued to work on it, I said, this is a small, strange project that I was thought, you know, I was writing mostly for myself. So I put in, you know, it was very autobiographical, but I put in a lot of emotional detail that I might not have put in the book had I known from the outset that it would be published in a major way. The journey to publication was interesting. Because if you want to hear crickets on the other end of, of the phone, you know, <laughs> call agents and say, would you like to read my book about a dog with an octopus stuck to her head? You don't get anywhere <laughs> fast. I remember trying to pitch it once as a cross between Joan Didion's Year of Magical Thinking, mm-hmm. which I love. Yes. Maybe. And Moby Dick. I thought of you. And <laughs> which, Moby Dick, oh my goodness. Which is not two books you should ever say. Yeah, that's together an interesting in the cross. Same yeah. <laughs> that didn't get me anywhere either. So it was sort of an interesting sort of path to publication. And I was actually going to self-publish it at one point. And I thought, you know, I'm proud of it as a piece of writing, but perhaps this isn't going to speak to a larger audience because of how personal it is. So when it did connect with readers in a very exciting way, I had a few moments where I was like, oh no, what did I actually say in the book about myself and about other people? And, Uh, And wait, just going back to your road to publication for a second, I thought I read an interview with you where you said you had actually given up on it, but then sent it to a friend and you published it without an agent, right? It went directly to... Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm old enough to know this is not how it works. This is a a little bit of magic, you know, that I can't help but thinking there's a little, you know, friendly dog spirit up there helping pulling some strings. But yeah, I was indeed, I had given up on, I spent two years trying to get it published. I had given up on it. I hired a freelance editor in New York because I was going to self-publish it. But self-publishing is a wonderful tool for writers, but it runs the gamut. Mm-hmm, you know, there's, mm-hmm. there's great self-published stuff and there's very sort of schlocky self-published things too. But I wanted at least for it to appear as professional as possible. So I hired a, a freelance editor. And it was through that editor that she was able to pass it along to someone she knew at Simon & Schuster. Wow. And that, you know, sort of snuck it in the back door, which they usually don't look at unagented things. Do you ever want to just call some of those editors who passed and be like, ha, huh, look what happened? Well, <laughs> I will say this, for if there's, a, you know, for, for aspiring writers out there, 
who are in the process of looking for an agent. And it is, you know, it can be very fraught with sort of the agent search. If you have an offer for publication, you kind of get to choose. So I could go back to the people yeah. who, you know, who had sort of passed before and be like, you know, maybe take yeah. another look at this. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I was very lucky to, to have that happen. I had changed the names. You know, there's some fictitious things. I never really thought there was an octopus on my dog. Okay. You know, and I had changed the names of all the characters. But there's some people it's hard to disguise. Um, mom comes to mind. Yeah. You know, somehow eagle-eyed readers crack that code. <laughs> um, so, you know, ultimately, though, it was a very good, positive experience for me. But I sort of understood immediately that what I wanted to write about next was something similar, you know, a character where they write something very autobiographical and it spirals beyond his control. The actual events of how it happened to me was not interesting enough to sustain a novel. But so I was looking, you know, and all apologies to to Mrs. Onassis, <laughs> as, we, as I call her in the book, I was looking for the octopus, you know, that, mm-hmm. that additional magical element that could elevate a simple story into, you know, and give it the the depth that a novel requires. And actually, of all things, you know, I had seen a Project Runway challenge where they did a Jackie O Project Runway challenge in season seven or eight a (laughs) while ago, but it always stuck with me because, you know, lots of people, you know, they showed a lot of pictures of her throughout her life. And, you know, designers gravitated towards, you know, like the, like a very sort of like Chanel like suit that she might have worn as First Lady or a, you know, a gauzy drape thing that she might have worn on the a yacht with Onassis or something. Mm-hmm. But there was, a, there was this one image of her walking down the streets of Manhattan with her face buried in a book. You know, and for those of us who have lived in New York before, I, you know, like that, I was like, oh, who's that woman? Because that, that's someone I relate to. Mm-hmm. And that was the most interesting version of Jackie to me. And I immediately wanted to know more about her. And I knew that she'd had this career in publishing, but I didn't know the particulars. But it started me down a road of being interested in her. And I read a few biographies on her at the time. And it was, I don't know what the exact moment was. I folded these two stories together. But once I did, I realized I had something special. It's so neat. Yeah. It felt so real. Like, are you allowed to just do that with any historical character? I know that's a silly question, but like, can you just make it all up and have her just, I mean, is it okay? Is, yeah, does, I know, right? Say, Do you well, ever get in trouble? That was my first question with, to my agent, <laughs> particularly, you know, she's well enough known that, you know, she, she's enough of a public figure that, yes, I do have the right to do that. Also, it's not slanderous in any way. Right. And it, I am a, a huge fan and I'm greatly admire this incredible third act that she had to her life that not a lot of people know about, Mm -hmm. you know? I wanted to say when she was done with men, but she she wasn't. She had a long-term relationship with Maurice Templesman, who was a sort of European businessman, Belgian businessman who stayed in the background. And jokingly, they called him Mr. Kennedy Onassis because she was finally front and center (laughs) in her life. But, you know, this career that she had, and she worked for 15 years as a book editor, editing almost, uh, no, just over 100 titles, I believe, over those 15 years. And I just thought that it's just such a fascinating thing. It's not the first thing we think about, unfortunately, when we remember her. Mostly, I think, by design. She was done with the spotlight. Mm -hmm. She had enough of that. She only granted one interview in her entire career to Publishers Weekly. So... I didn't entirely make it all up. I did a lot of a lot of research. There's some wonderful books on her publishing career that people can check out if they are interested in knowing more. But there is that little bit of magic where I had to fill in the gaps a little bit. And this is kind of a wish fulfillment, right? It's a little bit of a fantasy. How yeah. much do we all wish we could have a friendship totally. with someone like that? So I wanted to lean into the fun of it a little bit too. I loved how in the beginning of their interaction, you were talking about how people sort of stayed away from Jackie a little in the hallways of the Mm -hmm. editing because they just didn't know how to interact. And it took this one lunch lady, basically, Mm -hmm. who said, Jackie, what do you want? And everybody was more relaxed. Did you make that up? No, I didn't. That's a a wonderful little detail that I pulled from a a biography of her called Reading Jackie by William Kuhn. That actually happened. There was there was a sort of lunch lady who broke the okay. uh, the awkwardness in the, <laughs> in the office. So another really cool element of your book, in addition to weaving in this element of historical fiction, is you have this book within a book mm-hmm. situation, originally called the Quarantine, then called Ithaca, which you explain in the book. 
Have you ever thought about, like, because then I, when I finished reading the book, I then wanted to read the other book. <laughs> you wanted to read the book within yeah, the book. Yeah, I wanted to read the book within the book. Like, maybe there's, like, a little sliver you could write of that as, like, a... I don't know. Have well, you? <laughs> I, yes, I've I've thought about it. Yes, I've probably written a, a little bit more of it than appears in the book that you know sits in a file on my computer. But for the moment, I think I'm done torturing my mother. <laughs> she <laughs> would prefer that I find another subject matter other than mothers and sons. <laughs> but you had this great quote about your mother in the book when she had helped facilitate this cake building mm-hmm. contest between James and his dad. And he wrote, as the bridge that spans the widening gulf that exists between my father and I, my mother sometimes seems feeble. The cables that keep her suspended feel tired and frayed. But tonight, as she turns back to smile at me before patting my father on the leg, she seems fully made of steel. So that's nice. <laughs> that was like, It's not all bad. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not all bad, but it's complicated. Yes. And I think there's great beauty in in complication sometimes. You know, my mother is, is probably my biggest fan Aww. right now, which is very sweet, you know, despite the fact that, sh- that I'm sure she wishes I wrote about other things other than mothers. But, you know, she comes from a family where she was raised. People were very sort of not emotive in the same way way or not exploring of feelings, I think probably is fair to say. Mm -hmm. Whereas as a writer, you know, I always want to get in there and poke and Mm -hmm. and get it all out in the open. You know, it's just it's just my writer's curiosity. It's what, you know, I think of it kind of as a a life's work is just to talk about the messy parts. Mm -hmm. And so there is a little bit where, you know, we butt heads sometimes, but you know, ultimately and she's very thrilled for her son. And and I think nothing tickles her more than, um, you know, going into a bookstore and seeing her son's book. I'm sure. Shelves, like yeah. every mother's dream. Yeah, yeah. Kids, please write books so one day I can go into the bookstore <laughs> yeah, right. and, and cavell over you right. as well. <laughs> but you had such great details, and I wonder if these were from your own life where one time you cut yourself shaving and called your mother, like, I can't stop the bleeding. And even as an adult, you, like, turned to her for that. And Yeah, there is something. I, I don't think... You know, there are moments that happen to you in life, and it doesn't matter how old you are, that you still want that sort of motherly comfort. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if we're five years old, 50 years old, or, you know, into old age yourself when your parents are long gone. I think there's always something where you yearn for that safety. Mm -hmm. And yeah, some of those details I pull from life. Some are made up, but some, and sometimes I'll do a scene, it sort of feels like something that happened to me in real life, as long as the emotional truth is the same. Sometimes the actual details, you can fudge a little bit. I did the same thing. I like broke a spoon in college and like sliced open my finger trying to <laughs> yeah. scoop some frozen yogurt mm-hmm. at the time, you know, I thought was so healthy. And I remember <laughs> calling my mother and her being like, I'm not well, sure what, 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 can, what, I, what can I do? Yeah. Anyway, but, and so I related to that yeah. just it's in a lot. So you also, as the book goes on, and I won't give anything away, but you have it end in a way that I was personally was like not expecting it to go. When you started mapping out this book, did you start knowing all of the events that would unfold, including the ending, or did you take it as it came? Like, do you outline? Do you do you just flow with the characters? What's your process? Like? I do outline, but I don't know everything. Mm-hmm. I'm not a rigorous outliner. I know some writers have the whole book mapped out. And writing to me is a journey. And, you know, it's the same even when I travel, right? Like, I, I have the, the few highlights I want to hit, the few points of interest, But I like to leave some room open to discover things that I didn't know, Mm -hmm. you know, until I until I was in the thick of it. And so there are a few surprises along the way. When I wrote Lily and I decided on using an octopus in the book, I knew immediately the book needed to be written in eight parts. And each part would have an octopus theme. You know, one of the sections is called ink. So then I started, then I can sort of map out, oh, well, there's a bit about a Rorschach test in there and a tattoo. And so I could so I could start of, you know, it, I laugh now thinking about that particular example because an octopus is an invertebrate. But I always say, you know, that gave me a skeleton for the, for the book. And with the editor, it's sort of the same way. It's written in five parts. And they're sort of distinct... Uh, they're not quite each a novella, but they they have, you know, a distinct flavor to each one of them as well. I knew where the book would end, 
But I also wanted to play with certain surprises in the book as well. So I started thinking about, you know, clearly the editor, the titular editor is Jackie Onassis. But I started to think of the ways in which the mother could be an editor as well over the facts of James's life. And a little bit how James could be an editor over the audience. Like the book is told in the first person, but he's not always the most reliable narrator either, which leads to a, a surprise that comes later in the book, too. So I really wanted to to sort of think of ways in which they were all sort of editing the experience of this story. Hmm. That's, that's great. Yeah. You did a really beautiful job describing sort of same-sex relationships, especially as the men were getting older. You had this beautiful scene of outside a movie theater where one man is sort of straightening the tie or some mm-hmm. little detail mm-hmm. of his partner. And then in the book, you have James think, you know, is this what my relationship with my current partner is going to be like? Are we going to grow old together? And you go into, you know, quite graphic depth of some of their interactions, which I thought was great because I feel like I don't read that enough. I feel like it's not, was that intentional? Did you sort of scope the landscape and see what you wanted to add? Or I think you did a really beautiful job of of portraying all of that intimacy, well, really. thank you. Yeah, the, the interesting thing about writing that, now to have Jacqueline Onassis be a character in this book, she obviously passed away in the mid-90s, about 25 years ago. So I had to set the book, you know, before the book takes place in the early 90s. And that's an interesting time period in terms of gay relationships, gay rights, what was happening for gay men, particularly with the AIDS crisis, was, you know, we think of it, I tend to remember it as more of the 80s, but there were more fatalities in the first half of the 90s. It was really a very different time, and we forget how quickly, because gay rights, gay marriage, you know, these things, have society has changed so fast, Mm -hmm. so fast, that usually it takes generations for these types of changes to happen. That it was very interesting to go back and and sort of take the my sort of lens of today off and remember what it was like. And and for me personally, that's around the time that I came out myself in the early 90s. And I never thought I would see gay marriage in my lifetime. So that sort of model of relationship just was off the table. Mm-hmm. Additionally, there was an entire generation of men. 10 to 20 to 30 years older than me that was kind of wiped out, you Mm -hmm. know? And so you don't, they were missing. They were missing. And to see a couple together, an older couple together like that was not the norm. Right. Or they, you know, had learned to live a closeted life and and so they weren't as visible. And so there's a real haunting sadness to that idea. So when I spotlighted an older couple in the book, like I really thought that was such a beautiful moment and a, and a powerful thing for particularly young gay men at that time to see because mm-hmm. it does give them, I mean, it doesn't have to be aspirational, but it does lay out, oh, this this is one path that that is available to us if we want it. Yeah. And it's interesting to think like how how gay relationship models have changed so quickly in, in 25, 30 years. Was that vignette something you actually saw or another part of your imagination? I remember seeing not that particular vignette, but I, I do remember always being taken aback when I saw moments of affection mm-hmm. at, at that time as a, as a young man just coming out. And also, you know, I was, you know, I lived in a, a city in college when I came out and, you know, you'd always be scared. You know, it was scary. You know, even today, you know, we're having a slight backtracking into a little bit in our current political situation and climate. But it, it's, you know, you worry about holding hands in public or or kissing in public sometimes, but particularly then, like it was, it was a little bit dangerous. So when you see just a moment of intimacy, and this is just really just a, a man helping another man with his, with his tie, but it's, done with such love that it was, I remember seeing some moment like that that was, that was sort of sh- shocking to me. I always was able to clock it. And, and you know, th- those things, these little tiny acts just stay with you. And the way you wrote it, I mean, you wrote the whole book in such a visual way, which is probably why it's on its way to being on screen. But like that scene in particular to me, when I flip through and my mental images of the book is one that particularly crystal clear. So yeah. anyway, I just love the way you wrote that. Oh. Speaking of screenplay, so tell me about what's the latest on turning this into with Fox, right? This is this one's with Fox or the other one's with Fox. Tell me what, what's yeah, the story? Well, 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 you have so Fox much going on in Hollywood. With, Fox is merging with Disney at the moment. So there's a little bit up in the air. But yeah, I'm working with director Greg Berlanti, who did Love, Simon last year, and is quite a TV empire, to bring the editor to the big 
screen. Excellent. And I am writing the the adaptation, which I'm very excited about. And casting Jackie has been a Ooh. fun parlor game between, wow, you know, my yeah. friends and I. So what's exciting, well, two things. There's there's two great roles for women who are about 60 in this movie, the mom and Jackie. And there's so many actresses who are underserved for material. So I'm very excited to see a sort of double header with two strong women. That's the kind of movie that, you know, I grew up, you know, with like Terms of Endearment oh, or, my or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those uh, you know, or Steel Magnolias or those, those types of movies. That was one of the first movies that I realized like I could cry yeah. because of a movie harder than I could because of my own life. Mm-hmm. You know that feeling? Yeah. Like you yeah. don't realize. Like, anyway, go on. Yeah. So it's a tear, uh, tear jerker of well, all time. Well, as someone who writes sort of tear jerkers yeah. now, it's interesting. And then secondly, I'm excited because, you know, as pervasive as Jackie is in our sort of pop culture, we've never seen her portrayed at this age. I think, you know, there was an HBO adaptation of Grey Gardens where she showed up for a few minutes and she was probably 40, mm-hmm. 45 in there. But we've never seen her represented in pop culture at this at this point in her life and I'm I'm excited to to be a part of that. That's excellent. Yeah. And Lily and the Octopus is also being turned into Also being adapted into a movie by Amazon Studios. I did not write that. Okay. Interestingly enough, you know, when I decided I was working as a screenwriter, when I decided to write Lily as a novel, I sort of took off my screenwriter's hat entirely and sort of thought, okay, how can I lean into you know, if I'm going to make it a novel, how can I lean into the strengths of what what novels can do, what I can't do as a screenwriter? Mm -hmm. So it's very internal. It it takes place largely in one man's imagination. And there's, you know, a big battle at sea and there's a dog and an octopus and all this stuff where, you know, I could just, you know, I was snickering when I was writing because I could hear a producer saying, well, we're not doing that. We can't even do that. And like, (laughs) no one's going to give you the money for that. So when there was movie interest, I sort of thought, (laughs) <laughs> Good luck, yeah. you know, to whoever you hire to write it. And it turns out it was a wonderful writer who adapted it. And so moving forward slowly but surely. But I just didn't think, and also because it was so deeply personal to me, I just didn't think I would be the best person to adapt it, even if I knew how, which I did not. <laughs> uh, with the editor, however, it's a little bit more of a straightforward adaptation, compared to Lily, at least. And uh, I'm very excited to be to be at the helm of that. And is it fun working? I've heard it's really fun to get to the screenplay that you have a whole team that you're working with. Yeah, well, novel writing particularly is is a very lonely endeavor at times. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it's a double-edged sword. I remember the first time I sat down with my book editor for Lily, she was giving me a few notes and said something like, but I defer to your creative authority. And I almost fell out of my chair because of 15 years in trying to pursue screenwriting. And I like no one ever deferred to my, the screenwriter's creative authority. You know, a film is, it's a director's medium and it's a large, you know, there there are many cooks in the kitchen. But having spent now several years working on these two books and and a third, that I really welcome working with a team, especially, you know, when you assemble the right team, which I'm very lucky to be working with the people I am. And what's the third book? Yeah, it hasn't been announced yet, but it'll be out next year. Okay. Yeah, I'm you finished not it? really allowed to talk about. It. Yeah, I did. Well, I've, it's finish is a word on a sliding okay. scale. Okay. Well, you know, still tinkering, a draft but is yeah, done. a draft is done. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, that's exciting. Yeah. Fiction still. Fiction still. Yeah. This is also about a struggling writer. It is not. Okay. Good. Uh, it is not, <laughs> and I didn't. I didn't even think of that. I didn't sort of put together that I've t- now twice written about struggling writers. I guess. I'm not a struggling writer. I know. Anymore. I was like, I, I don't like think I do. you can write about struggling writers yeah. anymore. That's it. You're done. Uh, you have to move on to now, like, now a successful my, writer. Now that it's my <laughs> full time profession. But interestingly enough, the third book does have a character who was very successful and walked away from it. Oh. And I'm, I'm not considering doing that because I've waited my whole life to be this busy. Uh, <laughs> But I'm just putting that together in my head now. Interesting. Excellent. Yeah. And you have more ideas for after that? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. You know, you spend years writing, right? You know, and and people can, you know, you spend two years writing a book that people can read in two days. And you're, yeah. and you're and like, like next. when's the next one? And I'm like, I, ah. <laughs> I have I have faith. I'm sure you will think of more great stuff. Do you have any advice to aspiring authors? Yeah, don't try to copy anybody else's 
style or voice. Like the, the greatest thing you can do is discovering your own voice and and sticking to it. One, because it helps develop a, a brand later on. That's probably bigger thinking. But just in the, in the moment, I think it'll really serve you to find your way as you stumble through darkness, which is sort of what novel writing is. And if you have a story inside you and you don't see it, you know, if you don't see yourself portrayed or represented, if you have a story, you know, write it. Be the one to write it. Don't, don't wait for someone to give you permission to do it. Just do it. And, you, you know, you'll be surprised where the journey can lead. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Oh, this has been a lot of fun. Can't wait to see all these movies. <laughs> Waiting for the third book. Well, I mean, you, you're, me too. you're booking my entertainment quota for you know, <laughs> years to get. We'll try to leave room for others. So. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you. Today's episode was sponsored by Serial Box. S-E-R-I-A-L-B-O-X dot com. Serial Box dot com. Delivering addictive book content in short listen or read installments. Thanks to Ryan and Steve at Texture Sound for the audio editing and mixing. Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Mm-hmm.